my story uh, is uh, not that different to the sort of uh, traditional immigrant story um, in the sense that my parents came here uh, with the hope of creating a better life for their children. So my family are from Ghana. Um, and when I was growing up, uh, my grandmother died uh, when I was quite young. She died when I was about eight. And so my great-grandmother uh, became my de facto grandma. Um, and she would come to London. We were in East London in a place called Walthamstow, which is quite actually similar to parts of Bristol in terms of um, the uh, ethnic diversity um, of the area. And uh, she would come about three times a year to visit and she didn't speak English uh, but what was brilliant was uh, I spoke our mother tongue which is a language called tree and I would be so excited about her trips because it meant that I would get to hear her fascinating stories and Ghanaian culture uh, is steeped in mythology and folklore that's passed down from generation to generation via uh, an oral tradition and one of the stories that she would tell it was the story of Anansi the spider, um, or the original Spider-Man as he's called in Ghana. Um, so Anansi starts out as the lowest animal uh, in the animal kingdom and decides one day he wants to figure out how to rise to the top. And so he looks around, ooh, we've got some backup singers. <laughs> all of a sudden see an influx of people start coming in. Yeah, all the action's on the top floor apparently, though I think we're on the right place. Um, and so, so uh, he starts out at the bottom of the animal kingdom and decides he wants to figure out how to rise to the top. And so he examines the world around him and decides that the best way to do it is to own the most precious item in the animal kingdom, which is uh, the sky god's stories. And so he goes to the sky god and he says to him, I'd like to buy your stories. And the sky god says to him, well, number one, they're not for sale. And number two, what makes you think you, a low spider, can afford them? And so Anansi says, no, I really want them. And so the sky god is still reluctant to even have the conversation and Anansi persists because the wonderful thing about being at the bottom of the animal kingdom is you're used to hearing no, so no doesn't actually mean uh, the same as it does for everybody else. So Anansi persists and then the sky god decides he has to give him a chance. And what he does is he gives him the same chance that he'd given the seemingly, uh, seemingly uh, worthier candidates who had all failed candidates from some of the most prominent kingdoms uh, within uh, the surrounding areas. So Anansi uses his cunning, his wits and his wiles and somehow he manages to complete this seemingly impossible task. And he takes the Sky God, all the things that the Sky God's asked for. And so the Sky God is unbelievably impressed and from that moment onwards not only gifts Anansi with uh, the stories but also makes him the king of the kingdom, and as a result, here I am sharing the story with you now, because Anansi then shares the story with the rest of humanity. And the reason I reference the Anansi story is because there are two elements that I believe are so important, are vital uh, in terms of social mobility, and in terms of creating a society where everybody can contribute to the best of their ability, regardless of their background. And the first element is equal opportunity. Because even though the Sky God didn't think Anansi could complete the task, he still gave him the opportunity anyway. The exact same opportunity he had given the other candidates. And then the other piece is self-belief. Because though the Sky God didn't believe in Anansi, fortunately Anansi believed in himself. And so some of those themes are what I explore in the book. Because I believe that when we create a framework where we give everybody the right training, the right opportunity, and at the same time we instill within them a belief that anything is possible, then indeed anything is possible. So my own story reflects some of this. So as I mentioned before, I grew up in uh, Walthamstow. I take it nobody here is from Walthamstow? Oh my goodness! <laughs> huh? 
But you're still from Wolverstone. So that, so that means you're like an original star. I love it. Uh, whereabouts in Wolverstone? Do you remember? Uh, it's called Castleton Road. There are like terrace, rows and rows of terraces. Most of them are rows of terraces. Okay, well, I'm sure it's not that far from where I grew up. So fabulous. We've got one person other than me from Wolverstone. Who knew? Um, and so uh, the interesting thing about Wolverstone uh, was uh, it was a real multicultural area. Uh, the majority of people uh, in the area were white working class survivors of the Second World War who were really community minded um, and all about family. And they welcomed families like mine. And what we had was we had one of the poorest communities in London, but there was a real community spirit. My school was like the working class version of the UN. Uh, we had people from all walks of life. And when I was growing up there, it was just as Wolfhamster was about to sort of start becoming slightly gentrified. So you had a lot of uh, middle class do-gooders that didn't want to send their kids to private school that also sent their kids to my school. So we had everybody from everywhere. And difference and diversity was an asset and it was something that was celebrated. So from there, I went to work at KISS FM uh, and this was when KISS FM was becoming legal and again the idea of KISS was to bring the young people of London together uniting them through the power of music. So diversity and difference was celebrated, was an asset and was something that I thought came second nature to me and was something that I thought I was completely comfortable with. Until about five years ago when, uh, like most British television talent, I decided I wanted to try and uh, crack the Holy Grail and make it in America. Uh, and I moved to the States. Um, and I didn't quite crack the whole of America, but I made a little dent in her east and west coast. And I sort of stayed away from Kansas. And when you look at what happened in the last election, it was probably a good thing too. Um, and so while I was there, I was filming in Las Vegas. Um, and a young man appeared on set who was covered head to toe in tattoos um, and gang markings. And I immediately found myself feeling so uncomfortable around him. And it was the elephant in the room. He could sense my discomfort and so therefore he was going out of his way uh, not to seem threatening or menacing in any way. And I was retreating even more so. And in that moment, I was able to look at an issue that I'd always looked at as being on the receiving end as opposed to doing myself. As a black woman, as a working class woman, I've always looked at this issue as being somebody who's discriminated against as opposed to discriminating against others. And so it was a real light bulb moment for me. And it was a moment that made me decide that I wanted to figure out how to have a conversation around this issue and a conversation that was judgment-free and a conversation that was also solutions-driven, that was prescriptive, one that could give us the tools to try and get past all of this uh, discomfort. And I think one of the reasons that we are so uncomfortable uh, with these uh, issues is because it involves two emotions that most people want to avoid at all costs, and that's guilt and shame. And so I'm pleased to say that I pushed through my discomfort and I went to talk to this young man. And yes, he had had a hard start in life and he'd made uh, some wrong choices. But fortunately, our sound man, who was a lot more open-minded than me, I'm pleased to say, had taken him on uh, as an apprentice. And this kid was so excited about the prospect of a career in television and the career of changing not only his life, but his the life of his family as well and I couldn't help but think my goodness if somebody like me is even feeling uncomfortable around him this is not going to be easy and what are we all losing out on as a result of our limiting beliefs these are limiting beliefs that most of us have and I don't like extreme words you know at the moment there's a lot of conversation happening in this space and I think we're making it as if it's all the same thing, and I don't think it is. For me, I don't like extreme words like racism, and I think prejudice is far too nebulous because it doesn't really explain what we're talking about. I like looking at isms because I think where most people are, most people are at a place where 
for whatever reason, they just feel more comfortable around people who remind them of themselves. And I don't think it comes from a place of maliciousness, it just comes from a place of what you consider normal, what you're used to. And so for me, it's about creating tools that allow us to break through whatever those norms are. It's about creating a new normal and bringing difference into your life and celebrating it and realize that actually that's where the magic happens. Now, when we talk about diversity, a lot of the time we look at it from the issue of gender or race. And I think actually where diversity is concerned, we have to take an intersectional approach. We have to look at it from a broad perspective because it's only when we look at tackling what's happening with any group that's disenfranchised, any group that's discriminated against, any group who isn't able to contribute to the best of their ability. It's only when we do that that we're able to create a society that is actually inclusive and sustainable and a society that is, is created in a way that actually is something that can last uh, long term. So after that conversation with that young kid, I decided that I wanted to do something. I didn't know what that something was going to be. Um, and then a friend of mine called me and she said, oh, you know what, June, this was at the time when um, Sheryl Sandberg's Lean In came out. And she said, oh, June, you know what, you should write a book. And I said, really? And she said, yes, you should write a, a book. Um, I think we need the multicultural <coughs> Lean In. And I said, what? And I said, well, actually, you know, this issue happened to me. Uh, uh, when I was filming in Las Vegas and I've always wanted to start a conversation about it but I didn't know what and she said well I think you should write it and so for me I thought it was really important not just to make the book anecdotal but also to present the economic case because we live in a capitalist society and often we look at the moral and the social argument for this issue but actually the real big piece is the economic argument all of the data and the research shows the diversity is good for everyone, even those that are going to have to share that much more. Because when we're able to utilize everybody's talents, when we're able to bring out the best in all of our citizens, the whole all of our citizens of the country as a whole benefits. So from there, I thought, okay, it's time to create a framework that gives people the tools on how they better connect with the other. Because the wonderful thing about my job is throughout my life I've had to connect with the other. That's, that's what I do, that's what we do. You, find, you meet people who seem different to you, but somehow you find a common ground, you find common ground and you find that place to connect. So within there, there are six steps, uh, which I'm calling the six degrees of integration. See what I did there? Yeah, the world's separate enough. Um, and these are six simple steps on how you can better connect with the other. So the first step is to challenge your ism, which is everything that I've been talking, up, uh, talking about up until now, because we all have them. It's finding out what your isms are. Where are your blind spots? Where's the area that you just feel a little bit uncomfortable around? And how can you push through that? So the first thing is to do that, and on the website, diversify.org, there's an ism calculator, which is completely private and confidential, but it will help you to calculate your ism. Um, once you've uh, calculated and challenged your ism, uh, I would hope uh, that you would then check your circle. And a lot of people poop, have poo-pooed this one, but I think it's so important, because actually, if you look at those that you choose to socialize with, the people that you choose to have in your life, if they look like you, sound like you, think like you, believe the same things as you, then chances are you will have a linear outlook even if you don't want to. So it's really important to check your circle. And if by checking your circle you realize that perhaps you could make it a little bit more diverse, then I would hope you would create a new connection. So who are the people that you don't have in your life and how can you find them? Who are the people that you have something to offer to and also something to gain from? And I think often we think it's so difficult to meet new people, people who seem different to us, but it's not. Often, how many of us even speak to our neighbours anymore? It's actually usually on our doorstep. So from creating a new connection, I would hope you change your mind. 
Um, and then the fifth one is to celebrate difference. I think in Britain we have uh, a real issue with even acknowledging difference. Um, and actually there's nothing wrong with it. There's so much joy to be had from difference. There's so much to be learned. There's so much to be gained from bringing difference into your life. And then the sixth step is to champion the cause. Spread the word. Tell other people. Get them to also complete the six steps. And I think if we can all make these little small steps to better connecting with the other, we can create a society where we're not as scared of each other. We can create a society where we're comfortable with people who on the outside would seem slightly different to us. And I think in doing some of the research myself, looking at where my gaps were, aside from the story that I've just uh, told you about, even the area of disability. Um, as a 16 year old, I actually was uh, officially disabled for uh, two years of my life. Um, and then uh, I made a recovery. And from that moment onwards, I've never really considered it until I started doing the research for the book. And when you look at the data where our disabled community is concerned, it's shocking. We would never accept that from any other group. So some of the stats um, uh, that I'd like to share with you. So for example, there are 1.4 million people uh, in the UK uh, with a learning disability. Only 6% of them are in work. We would never accept that from any other group in society. One in five people in the UK has a disability or will have a disability at some point in their lives. And only 20% of them were born that way. So 80% of people that become disabled were not born that way. So this is something that can happen to anybody at any time. So where in your own life can you be more inclusive? Even just in your workplace. Is your workplace set up for difference? Is your workplace set up so that those who don't fit the usual mold can actually thrive in the environment that you work in? And if not, how can you influence that? If you're a leader, how can you change things? And if you're not a leader, how can you influence those in leadership positions to do so? So what I'd like to do um, is uh, read you a little bit uh, from uh, the intro of the book, uh, which sets out uh, some of the stuff that I've just spoken about. Um, and then it'd just be great to have conversation, because I think the thing with, these, uh, with this issue is it's, it's just lovely to talk, because often we don't talk about this stuff, and we are uncomfortable. Um, in, in addressing it or broaching it in any way, but actually it's when we do um, that we're able to move society forward. So I'll uh, read a little bit uh, and then I'd like to hear from you. Okay. So. so how it works is I look at all of uh, the other groups, um, and so it's other man, other woman, other body, and, and so on. Um, and I look at the other way, um, the old way, which is how things currently are, and the other way in terms of how things could be. So this is the intro, um, and I open the introduction with one of my favourite quotes by a man called William Sloan Coffin, uh, who was a civil rights activist um, in the 60s and a good friend of Martin Luther King's, and he's such a brilliant man who was born into one of the wealthiest families uh, in New York uh, and was actually a CIA agent um, and decided that uh, he instead wanted to leave the dark side as it were uh, and be a vessel of light and became a civil rights activist. So the quote is, diversity may be the hardest thing for society to live with and perhaps the most dangerous thing for society to be without. So only connect. The British humanist and novelist E.M. Forster famously wrote Only Connect, and he was absolutely right. While the earth is vast, we live in a small world full of opportunities to connect with each other, and it's only when we do this that the walls between us come down. Yet the majority of us seem to find this incredibly difficult, caught up as we are in the things that divide us. In one sense, of course, we are more connected than we've ever been before. Whether we live in the remotest parts of the world or in great international cities, such as, I was going to say London, but Bristol or New York, uh, we can connect across the globe at the click of a button. 
So it's a great irony that the economic gap between those at the centre of society and those at the periphery is ever-growing. Our great cities of culture and commerce are in fact cities of strangers, where individuals have rejected relationships with neighbours in favour of superficial relationships with an online community. We often ignore passers-by as we get on with our lives. We may shake my head, we may SMH, shake my head at news feeds that show injustice at home or abroad, yet somehow we continue on, unaffected by what happens to others. And yet, as the MP Jo Cox argued so passionately before she was murdered in 2016, we have far more in common that, than that which divides us. This isn't head in the clouds, liberalism speaking. This is indeed scientific fact. Genetically, human beings are 99.9% .9 identical. Our bodies perform in the same way, we breathe the same way, we eat the same, we sleep the same. And yet, we choose to focus so much on the 0.1% that makes us different. The 0.1% that determines external physical attributes, such as hair, eye and skin colour. This focus has been the cause of so much tension and strife in the world. Yet, by, by re-evaluating the importance we place on it, we have the power to change how it affects our future. What if we celebrated that 0.1% rather than feared it? What amazing things might follow for our society? The need to do this has never been so urgent. Thank thanks to the recent political upheavals of Brexit and the election of Donald Trump, the rise of extremism and economic instability. We now are more divided than ever before. But the ability to change this is firmly within our grasp. To heal the wounds that have been exposed, we need to diversify, and we need to do it now. This is an issue I've felt passionate about for a long time. It informs my work, my relationships, and my everyday life. And it's more than a question of encouraging human kindness. I've long suspected that there is a hidden financial cost to our lack of diversity. The research I've undertaken for this book has confirmed that. I decided to write about this issue, often drawing on my own experiences to present the issues that a lack of diversity is causing for us today, alongside the arguments for the social, moral and economic benefits of diversity. You'll also find practical tools on how we might go about creating a new normal that is equitable, diverse and prosperous. Why now? On the 28th of August, 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King, for me one of the greatest men of the 20th century without question, delivered his iconic I Have a Dream speech. I was always found his words laying out such a powerful and clear vision for global equality and unity and delivering a message of hope that we could all be a part of. Absolutely mind-blowing. He presented a comprehensive vision and framework for the much-needed journey that would get us there. And I firmly believe it's one of the best examples of the type of society we should all be striving to create. Now, over half a century later, where are we on that journey that Dr. King laid out for us? And what does that mean for humanity? The sad truth is it's a journey that many of us are yet to embark on. Prophesizing his own assassination, King ended his last speech with, I may not get there to the promised land with you. And indeed he didn't. And there have been claims that if Dr. King were still alive today, he would be incredibly disappointed by what he saw a world divided by gender, nationality, class, sexual orientation, age, culture, and of course the two big R's, race and religion. I would argue that actually Dr. King would not so be disappointed by what he saw, but rather what he couldn't see. It's what lies beneath the surface and the facade of tolerance and political correctness that causes the real malaise. The limiting viewpoints that are hidden inside us that we rarely speak of but often think about, and worse, sometimes act upon. Whether they are conscious or unconscious, it's these hidden and unexamined attitudes that shape the inequality we see today in society. The evidence of that is clear in the political upheaval that has occurred both in the UK and the US recently. There are many parallels between the shock results of Britain's Brexit referendum and the Electoral College victory of Donald Trump in America in 2016. As a board member of the official Remain campaign, 
I was certainly, in fa certainly not in favour of Brexit and put all my passion and energy into trying to convince the British public that Britain was stronger in Europe. The result was a painful and bitter blow and one that still hurts now. We will only see the true fallout now that Article 50 has been triggered and the negotiations have begun. However, whatever your views on Brexit, I think what is clear is that when we look at the causes and the reasons behind it, we must act. The majority of us recognise that there are things greater than ourselves that can unite us, the world we share and our common humanity. We know the need for understanding, connection and solidarity as one human family is more urgent now than ever. The greatest challenges of our time demand our cooperation. But how do we achieve this when we have been separate for so long? Change is not easy, but it is necessary. That's where this book comes in. So that's all. Thank you. <laughs>